I'm Maya Nicholson, Internet Lawfare, with an episode from the Lawfare Archive for April 6th, 2024. On April 1st, seven high-level Iranian military officials were killed in an Israeli airstrike on the Iranian consulate in Damascus, Syria. The strike comes amid already high tensions in the Middle East as a result of the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas. In response to the strike, Iran has vowed to retaliate. For today's episode, I chose an episode from December 2, 2020. In the episode, Benjamin Wittes sat down with Scott R. Anderson, Suzanne Maloney, and Natan Socks to talk about the killing of top Iranian nuclear scientist Mohsen Fakhrizada in November 2020 by an Israeli strike. They discuss why Israel conducted the operation, how effective the killing of Iranian nuclear scientists had been, and more. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, December 2nd, 2020. The top Iranian nuclear scientist has been killed, apparently in an Israeli strike. Mohsen Fakhrizada, who has long been the mastermind of the Iranian nuclear program, was gunned down, if you believe the news reports, in an attack with a remote control machine gun. Iranian reprisals are expected, although their timing and nature is not clear. It also puts the incoming Biden administration, which is looking to bring back the Iran nuclear deal, in a bit of a pickle. To chew it all over, I was joined in the virtual jungle studio by Scott Anderson, international law specialist and lawfare senior editor. Suzanne Maloney, the Vice President and Director of the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution and an Iran scholar, and Natan Sachs, Director of the Center for Middle East Policy at Brookings, where he focuses on Israeli policy. We talked about it all. Why would the Israelis conduct this operation? How effective has its killing of Iranian nuclear scientists been? Is any of it legal? And what does it mean for the future of U.S.-Iran relations? It's the Lawfare Podcast, December 2nd, An Assassination in Iran. Scott, get us started. Give us an overview about what we know about what happened over the weekend. Sure thing. Well, on November 27th, it appears that a senior Iranian scientist uh, and member of uh, the Revolutionary Guard Corps in Iran, an officer of some sort, but primarily a, a person involved in research and science development in, in relation to government agencies there in Iran, was assassinated uh, and killed as part of a targeted killing and attack. A little bit of an unconventional one compared to recent models, which we usually we associate with drones or airstrikes. In this case, some of the reporting that's come out, although there have been a little bit conflicting accounts, or there's always the possibility of kind of counter information coming out, is that uh, he was killed by, at least in part, by some sort of remote control operation, a machine gun from a truck, a Nissan that itself, uh, you know, lured him essentially out of his armored car where he was traveling with security detail with his wife, uh, and then killed him once he was lured out. And then the truck itself self-destructed to presumably obscure any evidence that might be gathered regarding the perpetrators. The gentleman in question uh, was known for his involvement in Iran's nuclear program um, several years ago, although I don't think the extent to which that program is still ongoing is in serious question. Uh, He's also involved more recently or known to be involved with things like COVID response and other scientific initiatives of government agencies in Iran that not strictly defense applications, but also things related to the Ministry of Defense and defense applications there, as I understand it. And, you know, was most notably identified verbally by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu as somebody, as a name to remember in association with Iran's nuclear program within the last few years. Nobody's taken credit for this attack, but a number of people have pointed to Israel as the likely culprit. That includes, at least in one, I believe, Washington Post story, uh, members of the U.S. intelligence community speaking on background, uh, who said that seems likely to be the perpetrator, although I don't believe the article indicated they had firm confirmation that that was the case. And I think that essentially brings us up to date. Natan, how confident should we be that this was an Israeli operation? Well, the Israeli denials are the kind uh, that usually go 
Uh, I have no idea who did it, but I think Iran should be considering its options, et cetera, et cetera. And we've heard that line from several senior Israelis, including some cabinet members. So it's the non-denial denial. This is basically the kind of denial that is supposed to allow the adversary a zone of deniability. So if they do not want to respond and seek revenge immediately, they can at least have the cover of no one is gloating, no one is saying, I did it, but it's not much of a denial. In other words, pretty confident. And there have been some reporting that, although it's not clear to me how credible, that this was done with some degree of U.S. intelligence or perhaps involvement. Do we know anything about the degree to which the U.S. may have been a passive party to this operation? I don't. And I would caution on these kinds of details, I would caution people who say they know a lot more. I think it's very likely to say that the Americans at least tacitly approved or had an idea that this might happen and didn't object. That, I think, is a fair assumption. What tactical cooperation there was, I do not know. And if anything, I would doubt there was a lot of tactical cooperation. This is not the type of thing that usually the Israelis would need American support for. There have been cases in the past where the common assumption is that there was cooperation. For example, the killing of Imad Mugnia, who was head of the military operations for Hezbollah. But in other cases, and especially recently inside Iran, at least what we know points to Israeli operations, often even as a favor to the United States, but not necessarily tactical cooperation. It's fair to say as well that the Israelis have a pretty long history of targeting Iranian nuclear scientists and the, and the U.S. has none. Is that right? Um, the former, yes. The Israel certainly has a long history of this. It was uh, a tactic employed presumably by Israel quite a lot uh, under uh, Prime Minister Sharon and Olmert and then continuing into Netanyahu. They started before Netanyahu. And, and it's essentially under Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, who was Prime Minister early to mid-2000s, the Mossad got the Iran portfolio. Then head of the Mossad, Dagan, became in charge of the Iran issue. And as part of that, many things happened. We remember Stuxnet, the cyber attack on Iranian facilities, but also assassinations of these kinds. Uh, The Americans, we know less. You know, perhaps some of the things we think were Israeli were American, but this would tend to be more part of the Israeli-Iranian, not Cold War, because it's quite hot, as we see just now, but it's certainly below the level, below the threshold of outright war and below the level where both sides admit that it's war and therefore necessitate revenge by the other side, as I mentioned before. All right, Suzanne, tell us about the target. Who was he and how big a deal is it? Well, Mohsen Fahrizadeh is often described as the kind of Robert Oppenheimer of the Iranian nuclear program, the architect of a decades-long effort on the part of the Islamic Republic to establish a fairly wide-ranging and sophisticated nuclear infrastructure with the ultimate intention, which is presumed by some of the past activities of developing the capability to have nuclear weapons. Fakhri Zadeh is part of a, a large infrastructure at this stage. There are at least some reports that suggest he was if not retired, he was no longer in a position to be uh, you know, sort of the, the key point person. But it's notable that uh, he was given a very prominent funeral, that in fact, pictures were released today of a medal that he was awarded in the aftermath of the 2015 nuclear deal by President Rouhani, signifying how central he has been to the Iranian nuclear effort, as well as to the diplomacy which produced um, this very highly contested arrangement between Iran and the international community to put some constraints on Iran's pathway to nuclear weapons capability. His departure, I think, leaves a hole at the very top. It sends a very um, disturbing signal to the rest of the Iranian security and intelligence establishment that Iran's adversaries, whether that's Israel, whether that's the United States, whether that's uh, local individuals who might be working with foreign powers, uh, are able to target people at the very senior levels of the Iranian bureaucracy not just around the region, as happened last January with the drone strike that killed 
Quds Force Commander Qasem Soleimani, but in fact within Iran itself. And this, of course, builds not only on the attacks that killed four nuclear scientists back uh, during the Obama administration and wounded another prominent figure at that time, but also on a series of revelations, frankly, blows to the, the, the dignity, as it's described in the Iranian media, of the senior security establishment, um, including the seizure of Iran's nuclear archives by Mossad back in 2018 from a warehouse in Tehran, and an assassination of an al-Qaeda leader who'd been resident in Iran for many years earlier this year, something that wasn't revealed by the Iranian media until it came out in the international press very recently. So the cumulative effect, I think, of all of this has got to be uh, highly disconcerting. And it's the subject of a lot of gallows humor on uh, Persian social media. But uh, one has to presume that that uh, underscores a, a certain degree of uh, unnerving among the senior establishment uh, and real concerns about the security of the country, given the reach that whomever undertook this operation has been able to, to have within Iran. So you've described a long-term and fairly aggressive Israeli effort with respect to the Iranian nuclear program, as well as, as Natan refers, the targeting of people like Mugnia, who are, though not Iranian, and their Hezbollah figures are, are part of the Iranian network of the projection of power. Leaving aside anything else, how effective has this been if, if we understand the Israeli objective to be to retard the development of, of Iranian, you know, nuclear capability, you know, the, the centrifuges have, have spun throughout a lot of this. H how should we understand the effectiveness or lack thereof of this very aggressive Israeli program? I think it's really difficult to assess from the outside. Ultimately, as you suggest, um, we haven't seen a manifest slowdown in Iran's determination to acquire greater capabilities in this nuclear program. And if anything, there are many who are convinced that these types of actions only um, persuade the Iranian establishment to double down on, on that quest. At the same time, I, I think it's clear, as I was suggesting, that you know there is a, a, a real danger uh, to the cohesion of the security establishment. Um, the joke that seems to be the most common refrain that I'm seeing, at least in, in various forms of social media, is a sense that you know the, the the response from senior leaders has been, well, we knew he was likely to be targeted, and yet they apparently did not do enough to protect Fakhrizade. So what does that say about the rest of the, the security of, of the country? And I think that there's a direct connection between this and Iran's uh, engagements across the region, that in effect, Iran is very successful at projecting its own power. But there have to be real questions about uh, domestic security at a time where it appears that the Israelis are able to um, identify and pick off key targets. So I think all of this is connected to what Natan uh, referenced as a kind of not a cold war, a very hot war. From my perspective, the, the bigger implications are, are not simply for the fate of nuclear negotiations, but for what this means in this ongoing confrontation that has been uh, underway across the region where the Israelis have, have uh, targeted Iranian commanders and, and, and Iranian-backed forces in Syria, in Lebanon and occasionally even in Iraq, um, how does the how do the Iranians uh, retaliate? How do they seek to push back? They have a lot of different levers to do so, um, and their capabilities are fairly well dug in. So even in removing particular individuals, as you suggest, is not likely to manifestly change their strategy. All right, I want to come to uh, the question of Iranian retaliation in a moment, but before we do. We would not be lawfare, Scott, if we didn't at least discuss the question of the legality of this strike. This seems to me to be a pretty easy one. Is there any colorable argument that if we assume this is 
if we take this to be an Israeli operation, that it is a lawful one? It is hard to see exactly what that would look like, at least under the more conventional or even the somewhat more idiosyncratic views of international law and the law of armed conflict um, that the international community has and that states like the United States have. Although Israel does, it's worth noting, have certain uh, perspectives, particularly in this issue space that depart even from further from kind of the international consensus than uh, the United States or certain other states do. You know, generally situations such as tar- of targeted killing like this in a, a context where you're not involved in an armed, con- armed conflict are only really justifiable where it's absolutely necessary to stop some sort of, uh, you know, greater loss of life or greater violent incident. So, you know, shooting a suicide bomber before they can trigger uh, trigger a bomb that's going to kill more people. That This doesn't amount to that sort of scenario as far by any facts that we're aware of at this point, certainly. Um, if anything, this individual doesn't appear to have been had any sort of finger on the trigger of any sort of threat and all like that. It's not even clear he was involved currently with any ongoing activities as much as something in the past. If this were in the context of an armed conflict, uh, and this is something that people have suggested, although it's not a position that you know the Israeli government has espoused, that there is some sort of ongoing armed conflict between Iran and Israel, notably during the last kind of spree of killing of Iranian nuclear scientists between 2010 and 2013, we saw Alan Dershowitz and a few other people make this argument that there is, in fact, this ongoing armed conflict essentially between Iran and Israel dating back perhaps to, I think it was 1992, you know, attack on uh, Israeli embassy in Argentina, uh, going through threats against Iran related to the nuclear program uh, in the Obama era and kind of leading into that period. And I I guess in theory, in in the present day, and it's worth noting, we have seen, you know, ongoing hostilities between Iranian forces and Israeli forces in Syria, most notably, um, with Israel pursuing a number of strikes on IRGC facilities there. Uh, shooting down a drone that crossed into Israeli territory two years ago or so. Um, so, so you know, you have a bundle of facts here, but none of it really amounts up to, and nobody's really openly asserted of the parties that this amounts to an actual armed conflict. Even if it did, even if that were the case, this was a hot war, you would have a hard argument among the facts known to us about this individual that he would qualify because he is by most appearances, by all appearances, civilian, engaged in civilian activities. And usually civilians are not people who can be directly targeted for sort of military action by military forces, at least into the point where they're directly participating in hostilities. And that's you know a bit of a term of art. There's some debate about exactly where the line is. But as far as we know, nothing he's involved in really appears to reach that line. Maybe if he were directly involved in you know, building a nuclear weapon that had reason to believe was going to be used against Israel as part of this armed conflict, then maybe you get closer to that direction. Even there, I think it's pretty contentious and debatable. But there's just no sense of facts here. Uh, now, you can see, you know, threads that people may try and pull out to make an argument here. Uh, again, the fact that this is uh, related to a nuclear program, if, especially if he had some sort of ongoing role. Uh, obviously, nuclear weapons are kind of this uh, uniquely catastrophic. Uh, and so some people might argue there's some sort of spectrum effect, which is that the the lower involvement, lower level of risk is warranted because the consequences of something happening would be that much more devastating. Maybe some people might pull on the thread that he was an IRGC member and therefore has some attachment to a you know paramilitary, quasi-military unit within Iran and therefore maybe not have been a strict civilian in that sort of context. But they're all very weak threads to pull on. I don't think the sort of thing most people would find particularly persuasive, even among you know legal scholars like some in the United States, particularly the United States government, that gravitates towards Israel on the perspective of certain international legal standards like aspects of anticipatory self-defense, views about the appropriate uh, proportionality and how it's applied in these sorts of circumstances that are a little broader than a lot of the international community, certainly than the International Court of Justice is usually gravitated towards. But the United States, I think, would even have trouble getting on board with this because these are pretty pretty bright lines that it draws out in its own law of war manual and guidelines that it's really indoctrinated into its soldiers saying, here's the appropriate way to use military force. Uh, And I think that's one of the reasons why, as Natan noted, I find it very unlikely that the United States was directly involved in this. I certainly hope they weren't. If they were, there would be a very colorable, incredible argument that, you know, aiding and abetting an action like this would put the United States in violation of its international legal obligations uh, by basically facilitating a violation of the the law of armed conflict uh, or international human rights law. If there is an armed conflict, which seems actually more likely here, Uh, you know, that doesn't mean that maybe there wasn't some sort of 
tacit signaling that, you know, the Trump administration didn't intend to raise a political stink about things that Israel did during this period. Um, there may have been some sort of signaling and general awareness, but involvement and participation would really be drifting into pretty new territory that I suspect a lot of people in the armed services and even, you know, potentially the intelligence community would be uncomfortable with. So, so I suspect it stops short of that sort of aiding and abetting relationship or knowledge. Yeah. I tend to agree with that and and actually the the implausibility of this complying with international law as anyone understands it uh strikes me as a alternative explanation to Natan's about whether why the Israelis have never formally acknowledged these operations you know when they conduct strikes that they have high confidence in their their lawfulness they do tend to acknowledge them and they're not shy about you know for example acknowledging that they operate in Syria but these attacks on civilian Iranian nuclear scientists they have never acknowledged and i wonder if that is less because as Natan says it gives the Iranians a way to back down if they choose to, and more because they actually don't want to acknowledge acknowledge activity that you actually could not defend, even under aggressive U.S. precedents like the Alalauki killing, don't get you to somebody who is not in any sense operational from a military point of view. I think that's right. All right, let's talk about Iranian response. At the time of the Soleimani killing, Suzanne, we had a long conversation about what kind of response we should expect. And as I recall your analysis of it at the time, it was don't expect it to be immediate. The the Iranians are very patient and they have very long memories but they will respond and it will be substantial. So I have been, you know, patiently waiting ever since, and they haven't done all that much other than that initial missile attack. Should we look at this the same way and say, you know, they cannot take this lying down, they're going to respond in some pretty significant way, but they will bide their time and they'll do it in a time and place of their own choosing? Yeah, I think we have all um, learned a lot about uh, how the Iranians read these incidents, especially in a year where they're anticipating a, a, a very significant shift in U.S. policy, and in a year that has been disrupted by other factors, most notably COVID, which hit Iran earlier and harder than almost any other country in the world. So we have not seen the sort of cataclysm that I think many people anticipated in early to mid-January of 2020 when the United States and Iran came very close to the first, I think closer than at any point since the revolution, to a serious armed conflict between them. And I don't think we will be there anytime soon, despite a lot of breathlessness in, in the in the press and in some of the punditry about Fakhrizadeh's assassination. Fakhrizadeh does not have the same sort of uh, recognition in terms of the Iranian general public that Soleimani did. Soleimani was a figure, a charismatic figure, who had deliberately elevated his own profile with a lot of support from the establishment um, as a means of of reassuring the Iranian public at a time where when ISIS appeared to be um, dangerously close to Iranian borders, but also as a way of kind of what Mike Pompeo, uh, Secretary of State, described as swagger. This was, uh, Soleimani was Iran's swagger in terms of its regional presence. Fakhri Zadeh was the shadowy man um, behind a program that until the nuclear negotiations began in earnest in 2013, was not often discussed in the Iranian public. You know, that's changed radically over the course of the past seven years. Um, But for most of the the program's existence, uh, it was very much cloaked in terms of public discourse. And so Fakhri Zadeh didn't have any kind of public profile. Um, There was a lot of uh, there were a lot of questions after his death 
about uh, you know which pictures were him and, and precisely how well known he was. But I think you know we're we're dealing with a very different set of circumstances here. And yet, as I said previously, you know this is a significant enough hit happening on Iranian soil that I think um, it has uh, huge ripple effects for the senior leadership of the Islamic Republic. And they've got a choice to make because what they see is not just this one incident, of course, but you know the culmination of a, of a maximum pressure campaign of the Trump administration, which has had devastating economic effects, but has also involved a, a lot of kinetic action against Iranian commanders in the field. Um, to it, there was there are reports that even uh, since Fakhri Zadeh's assassination, there was a Revolutionary Guard commander who was killed by a drone strike uh, along the Syrian border. And so, you know, they see a, an effort to try to degrade Iran's capabilities around the region and at home, to do so in a way that flaunts the security flaws of the establishment and they are deeply concerned, according to a lot of credible reports, that Trump on his way out, either the, himself or uh, via his close relationship with Israel, is going to try to do as much damage to Iran, essentially to clean up um, as much of the, the bad actors as, as can be done, and to leave a flaming mess for the Biden administration, which of course has stated that they would like to revive diplomacy with Iran and restore the 2015 nuclear deal if both sides can revert to their obligations. So there's a lot of trepidation. There's a, you know, I think um, a calculus which will will probably go both ways. Um, some within the establishment who believe that the best approach under these circumstances with weeks left to go until Biden assumes the presidency will be looking to hold their powder and to try to avoid any provocations that essentially play right into the hands of, of whomever is goading the Iranians. But there will be the temptation to respond. And so I think, you know, the most likely set of scenarios, is the one that we've seen, you know, play itself out over, over, you know, consistently over many years, which is, is that the tempo in Iraq is likely to intensify. Um, particularly as U.S. troops may be poised to be downsizing in Iraq and elsewhere around the region. Uh, Iranian militia, Iranian-backed militias are going to accelerate their own tempo of actions against U.S. interests in Iraq. And I, I'm afraid this plays out in a way that, that you know, doesn't satisfy any side, but really just leaves the poor Iraqis once again um, in a much worse security and political situation. Natan, to what extent should we understand that to be intentional on the part of the Israelis, not with respect to burdening the Iraqis with the response, but on the one hand, there are some real tactical benefits to uh, taking this guy out. But the other thing that happens if you do it is that you create Iranian response that as Suzanne just described, makes it very difficult for an incoming Biden administration to navigate the world. And of course, since the incoming Biden administration seems to want to return to the Iran deal, uh, which the Israelis dislike, is part of the strategic objective here from the Israeli point of view to make that more rather than less difficult? I think it's an excellent question. I think there's maybe some exaggeration about how much the Israelis are looking for actual explosion now in the combat between the two parties. But in the past, if the Israelis have considered doing this, and there are some reports that they did even way back before 2009, there was always the issue that this might lead to much more and therefore caution was in order. And especially if the Americans would prefer this not to happen, which was certainly the case in the Obama administration. Those hurdles are now not there. Now, if Iran decides to retaliate significantly, the Israelis would see some benefit in that, although, of course, they could be hit and the population, if, if something major blew up, then the population in Israel could be hit very severely, especially if Hezbollah joined the fight. But moreover, Washington at the moment, until January 19th or January 20th at noon, does not object to these kinds of things. So the hurdles for doing this or the, the vectors against it, they are removed. 
Secondly, and it's a very important point, you, you posed the question to Suzanne earlier, where, is, where has the Iranian response been? And this is a very good question. The Israelis for a long time always assumed that Qasem Soleimani in particular, they would often refer to him personally by name, that he will respond and you should not underestimate the Iranians, etc., etc. And yet in very recent years, the Iranian responses have been either missing or been very limited badly managed, bungled, or stopped by the Israelis. So the Israelis at the moment are feeling quite triumphant compared to the Iranians, and these latest operations inside Iran, uh, including uncovering the the archive of the nuclear program earlier from inside Tehran, all these have shown sort of a tactical advantage that have added to the boldness of the Israeli operation. The most important point, though, in your question, I think, regards the Biden administration. The Israelis have not changed their opinion one iota about the JCPOA. If anything, their worldview has been uh, strengthened in their mind, that maximum pressure is far preferable to a bad deal, and they consider the JCPOA to be a bad deal, and that America's withdrawal from the JCPOA also proved the weakness of the Iranian hand, that Iran has not done things that Israel and the United States would deem unacceptable, so long as they were both intent on preventing Iran from achieving a nuclear weapon at all costs. And that, they would argue, shows that the JCPOA was leaning towards Iran, because if Iran, in fact, would accept much less, then the negotiation could have been much tougher. And so preparing for the Biden administration, yes, the Israelis would like to have good relations with the Biden administration, but more than that, they would like to prevent what they think would be a terrible Iran policy. And that would include a wholesale return to the JCPOA, which is not necessarily, of course, what the Biden administration will do in terms of at least the wholesale part. And if it's harder for the Iranians and if Iran perceives its position to be weaker and if the leverage is on the other side, all the better. All right, Scott, all of that does not sound like a recipe for harmonious relations between the Iranians, the Israelis and the incoming Biden administration. If you are the Biden people thinking about how to navigate this and you want to, you may want to revitalize the JCPOA, you don't want the Israelis sort of going rogue, and you obviously want to minimize the capacity for Iranian retaliation for this, as well as the Soleimani strike for which, you know, we were actually responsible it's a pretty tough nut for an administration coming in, no? It absolutely is. I mean, I think the only line of action that you can really do as an incoming administration without the instruments of diplomacy and really any ability to really steer U.S. policy for the next 45 days or so, uh, 50 days or so, is to come in and, and essentially just encourage both sides to exercise some restraint, which is, I think, more or less what we've seen the Biden folks kind of doing a little more quietly to the Israeli side, uh, more publicly to the Iranian side. But by virtue of saying, look, 50 days from now, it's going to be a new order and there's going to be some new discussions and we need to actually try and avoid doing things that are going to change the landscape and narrow the opportunities for finding arrangements before we get there. You know, I think that argument probably has some sway with the Iranians, uh, you know, because we have seen them exercise a degree of restraint in their responses, as I, I think Suzanne described well, which in terms of trying to, you know, target in response to Soleimani strike instead of going out and attacking, uh, you know, American civilians somewhere or assassinating, trying to assassinate a U.S. ambassador. Instead, they did a military target. And it was a military response that, uh, you know, was not maximized for uh, fatal impact, uh, at least by some assessments. And certainly wasn't, hasn't one, been one, as we noted, that we've seen them follow up on as of yet. Uh, and so there's a there's an element of restraint there, even as they're making a very public sort of response. In this case, uh, again, you know, maybe they're going to feel pressure to make some sort of response, but they may have reason to try and keep it to a military target as opposed to a civilian target, something that's going to be a civilian. I think any sort of response against civilian target is going to be incredibly hard for the Biden administration to swallow uh, and then re-engage on. And I think Iranians are aware of that. And and Biden folks seem to be signaling that. On the Israeli side, you know, I think it's a harder sell for the reasons that Tan's noted, that they're just not big fans of the GSPOA arrangement or, or really, I think, much uh, serious engagement around these sorts of issues as opposed to um, a much more pressure-oriented campaign towards the Iranians. We've seen that already 
efforts being made, I think, by the Israeli government to work with other kind of quiet partners in this arrangement, most notably the reported meetings between Mohammed bin Salman uh, in Saudi Arabia and the prime minister Netanyahu, both of whom are united and have you seen this kind of rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Israel to some extent, mostly motivated by their shared security concerns over Iran and shared preference for a strong anti-Iran policy. So you're seeing these efforts to shore up something of a little bit of an independent foreign policy from the United States on the Iran account, I suspect. Uh, and this may feed into that. This is, uh, you know, the Israeli government here is signaling both A, taking advantage of a window of opportunity where it's less likely to take strong pushback from the United States, at least for the next 50 days, to perhaps send some strong signals, do some destabilizing on the Iranian side, poke a couple of buttons that in the strategic picture they may weigh in their favor, and to send the signal saying that we are serious about taking this action and have serious capabilities of doing so, even as they are uh, beginning to you know, align themselves with other traditional U.S. partners in the region that also have real reservations about a return to a more G- JCPOA-like policy or something closer to that direction. So I don't. I, I suspect you're going to see the Israelis be a little more resistant to that idea of reining in these things. Maybe they're not going to do something this provocative again. I'd be kind of surprised if they did. Although who knows? Um, but I doubt you're going to see you know a stop to uh, attacks like we saw on the Syria Iraq border, or if there are reports of you know other stockpiles of IRGC arms and things like that within a, a concerned radius of the border with of near parts of Syria that. We may see more of those sorts of military actions, which Israel has continued to pursue. And so, you know, it's a difficult position for the Biden administration. Once they get into office, there's a little bit more they can do. But if the Iranian retribution comes, certainly once they're in office, and really even before they're in office, particularly once they're in office, that really could set back in major ways in efforts to sort of re-engage with the Iranians, make it much more politically difficult. The one, you know, the one silver lining is, again, I think the Iranians are aware of that and want to have those opportunities to re-engage and therefore might exercise the restraint the Biden folks have been counseling them. The countervailing factor there is just the domestic factor and kind of the international, perhaps international reputation prestige factor where the Iranians are feel a pressure to respond in some way, even if they know uh, it may hurt them with the Americans re-engaging with the Biden administration and and threading that needle. It's not clear how whether threading that needle is even possible, but if they try and do so, there's a good chance they're going to fall on the wrong side of uh, the Biden administration in the end. Yeah. So let's talk about that, Suzanne. I can look at this from the Iranian perspective and see two completely different roads. One is hey, we wanted the JCPOA for domestic economic reasons. We really needed the JCPOA. None of that has changed. In fact, it's all the worse now because of years of the maximum pressure campaign. We need to re-engage, re-engage in a fashion that is preserves our, our dignity and honor, but we really have no choice but to re-engage. And, and that means to you know, however we talk about it to, you know, get in conversations with the new administration as quickly as possible. The other way to look at it is, hey, we tried. The Americans showed that even if you make a deal with one group of people, the next group of people won't stand by it. They'll still strangle you economically. The only solution to this is maybe talk to them, but really stand up for yourself and don't ever put your faith in negotiations with the Americans again. So which which Iran should we expect or are both going to show up at the same time? Well, this is Iran, so there's never just one single truth. And I think both of those impetuses that you just described are evident in the way that the Iranians have been approaching this issue for many months. And consistently, of course, since it was clear that Biden won the presidency, um, which is to say that, you know, I think that there is a recognition still within the political establishment that while they've been able to manage and muddle through these very severe sanctions, ultimately it has come at an incredible cost to the Iranian economy, to the resilience of society. Um, and to ordinary Iranians in terms of the cost of living and, and basic living standards. And, and there's really no way to compensate for that or to um, avoid it um, without finding some kind of modus vivendi with the United States on the nuclear issue that produces a, at least enough sanctions relief to bring you back to where 
things were in early 2016 when the deal first went into implementation. That was not considered a perfect period from the Iranian point of view. So many sanctions did remain in place and the international business community was deeply reluctant to deal with Iran simply because of the sanctions as well as the complexities of doing business there. But it, it was preferable to what came after Trump uh, entered office. At the same time, you know, this entire episode has confirmed the darkest suspicions of the Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei, and many within the establishment on various parts of the political spectrum within Iran that the United States is not a reliable actor, that Washington cannot be trusted to make good on any commitments that it, it might sign. And so ultimately, Iran has to find a path that is effectively outside of U.S. reach. The difficulty, of course, with that is that, you know, it, it simply isn't going to be as uh, successful uh, in terms of rehabilitating the Iranian economy and, and ensuring the continuation and endurance of the Islamic Republic as a regime as negotiations. So my guess is what we'll see um, is what we saw over the course of the many years that it took to bring about a successful negotiating process you know, sort of fits and starts on both sides to try to reestablish some dialogue, a lot of deep mistrust. Iran has a presidential election coming up uh, in the middle of 2021, and that will probably defer any timetable for any serious deal making um, with the Biden administration simply because Rouhani at this stage is unpopular enough that I don't think anyone wants to give him credit for a late game save. However, I do think that there will be um, efforts on both sides to at least start some kind of a process of dialogue. And the best way that the Biden administration can do that is by providing some kind of early humanitarian gesture to the Iranians, especially around pharmaceuticals and medical devices and, and food, all of which uh, are not legally sanctioned, but have been impacted by sanctions which have uh, affected Iran's access to the international financial system. And so if the Biden administration wanted to provide some kind of a goodwill gesture, that would be a way to start. And then hopefully some kind of process of conversation can begin um, whereby the, the two parties can come to some sort of an agreement, perhaps to be implemented after an Iranian election, that would bring them both back closer to compliance with the nuclear deal. The challenge here is that you know the Biden administration will have many other priorities, fairly urgent priorities focused uh, on the American homeland, but also more generally around worldwide pandemic management and prevention. Uh, and you won't be able to have a secretary of state as deeply engaged as John Kerry was in this process. There is going to have to be a sort of low level effort, or not low level, but at least working level effort to, to make some progress whatever progress can be made, but really to situate this into something that looks like more normalized diplomacy, mainly because returning to the JCPOA doesn't get us very far. What we really need with Iran is a follow-on agreement. And if you thought the JCPOA was difficult to achieve and highly polarizing in terms of the domestic reception, um, anything that's uh, kind of more for more deal with Iran will be even tougher and, and even more challenging to, to achieve. So we just have to create a process that can really um, last for uh, the time that it's going to take to hammer out additional issues, including Iran's regional behavior, including uh, you know measures uh, that recently have been suggested by families of those who've been taken hostage in Iran, uh, dual nationals and foreign nationals, that we have to have some kind of an agreement that addresses issues beyond just the center. Natan, Iran, it turns out today, is not the only country in the region that seems to be headed for new elections. The Israelis are uh, now, it looks like, going to have their fourth election in two years. Uh, which is looking increasingly Italian on the Israelis' part. On the other hand, this issue, the issue of Iran, is one of some degree of political consensus in Israel. Does the instability of the Israeli political system in the coming year play any material role in, in how this is going to look? It doesn't play a huge Pardon this because you mentioned the consensus. There is a difference of opinion in the Israeli establishment about how to deal with the United States vis a vis Iran. How much confrontation does one want with an American administration? 
a different prime minister, I think, would have been very unlikely to, for example, address a joint session of Congress against uh, President uh, Obama then uh, trying to pass something. But the basic position regarding Iran, regarding what leverage towards Iran, how that should be used, all of this is in relatively close consensus. So the differences are, again, on the United States, as I said, and perhaps on the utility of unilateral Israeli use of force, not targeted killings, but larger than that. If I may add, though, one point on, on what, are, what Suzanne mentioned earlier, I think there's a real danger for the Biden administration, and I think it's, it's more than danger. There's a likelihood that they will stumble severely on this because their initial domestic incentive is to find a way to somehow regain Iranian trust in them and to re-engage diplomacy and to prove that Biden is not Trump. And the international logic, to my mind, and only my mind, is the reverse, which is everyone and their sister knows that Biden is not Trump. The Iranians have been waiting for four years for someone other than Trump. That is why they did not necessarily have to cave to maximum pressure, etc. There are also very many other reasons, including the extremely bad way in which maximum pressure was employed. But there is a real danger that this pressure towards the Biden administration to somehow prove something to the Iranians will make the Iranians take a very different position and make reaching a deal that much harder. Iran at the moment needs a reprieve for maximum pressure and a return to diplomacy far, far more than Biden or Blinken or Israel or anyone else needs it. They're the ones on the ropes at the moment. In some ways, that is not good. Certainly, humanitarian assistance and COVID-related issues should be done simply because we are human beings. But relieving Iran from this pressure simply because of domestic American issues or a difference with Trump is a mistake. It should be done in the context of a sound policy, but that sound policy should also take into account that four years have passed. Uh, It has been shown also that Iran really does need this much more than the United States. And since the challenge of following up on the JCPOA with something much more difficult, it will be very big. That challenge will be very hard. All the leverage that is at the disposal of the Biden administration should be kept and not squandered simply because of domestic need or a fear of how the Iranians will respond. This is the kind of logic also that, that in Israel, I think, is, is pretty prevalent. And there's a genuine fear of the Biden administration, not Biden himself. I think there's actually a lot more, say, hope in Biden, say, than they had in Obama for many reasons. But there is a fear of a return to Obama-Biden administration mindset of chasing the Iranians, although, of course, that's a caricature, but of how the Israelis perceived it and the Saudis and others of chasing the Iranians and trying to prove goodwill to the Iranians, where sometimes that is, of course, in order. But first and foremost, it should be the Iranians doing the reverse, showing that there is someone to speak to. Whether or not that's correct or not, it would be a better American position, I think. Can I just jump in here very quickly to to just point out that there is some urgency from the American side that goes beyond just signaling virtue of uh, not being Trump, which is the fact that Iran has uh, amassed a much larger stockpile of low enriched uranium, and there are new threats now from the Iranian parliament that I think you know we've heard in, in past times, but certainly an Iranian government could begin to make good on uh, to throw out the inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Agency and to cease uh, abiding by some of the uh, additional measures that Iran agreed to do as part of the nuclear deal, particularly um, those within the additional protocol to the non-proliferation treaty. So, you know, if Iran engages in brinksmanship around its own obligations under the deal, that will rocket this issue up the agenda for the Biden administration. And despite what, you know, I fully agree with Natan's point that Iran needs a deal at least as much, if not more, than, than the United States does. Uh, I, you know, the fear of Iran continuing and accelerating its progress toward nuclear weapons capability may drive uh, this issue fairly high on the agenda for the Biden administration. And, and it's that fear that I think, uh, you know, that, that the Iranians will be goaded to leave the deal or to, to take steps that will not be reversible 
uh, and move them closer to nuclear weapons capability uh, that is driving some of the concern uh, and the interest in diplomacy from the U.S. side. We're going to leave it there. Scott Anderson, Natan Sachs, Suzanne Maloney, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. And this episode is a good example of what that cooperation looks like when we have an all Brookings cast on the Lawfare Podcast. Our audio engineer, who is not an employee of the Brookings Institution, he's an employee of Goat Rodeo, is Zachary Frank. The Lawfare Podcast is produced and edited by Jen Patya Howell. You should do your part to promote the Lawfare Podcast. Share us on Facebook, pin us on Pinterest, upvote us on Reddit, and certainly tweet about us prodigiously. Our merch is available at the Lawfare store where you know you want it. You should leave us a rating and review wherever you found us. Our music is, as ever, performed by Sophia Yan. And as always, thanks for listening.